Hello again everybody and welcome back to Dark Souls 2. I'm Necromanticer and this, well, sadly this is not Faram, the God of War. This is one of my just made up characters, Veer the Gilded. I went with a very lightning focused theme with him. I have the Hyde Knight Great Lance and Hyde Knight Sword. And you may be wondering to yourself, why exactly am I seeing Veer the Gilded and not Faram, the God of War? Well, the answer is quite simple. I lost the footage to the second episode of The Blind Run. Yes, I've been tearing my hair out for the past several days trying to figure out what exactly I'm supposed to do with this series now that I've kind of lost the middle section of The Blind Run. I have the third and final episode where I complete it, all recorded nicely nice, but uh, it is... It has been quite the thing, I must say. So, I thought about it. I asked for a little advice from some friends, people who opinion of my value, and I decided that I'm going to play through the missing section on another character, and hopefully that'll give the same impression. I still haven't played the DLC on any other characters besides Faram and this, so I'm still not like unduly familiar but at the same time it just I can't have a blind run because I don't have the footage I lost that when I was moving some files around and sadly there's nothing to be done about that so we're going to be making a go of it as Veer the Gilded he's the closest character I could really find in just a sec I'll pull up his stats after I kill this little Lovely right here. Plus 10 for both weapons. Only got his cleric small shield to plus 4. It doesn't really do much blocking. It's mostly for lightning. And you just don't see much of that anymore. Mastodon armor, cyan gauntlets, saint's trousers, and just the bone ground for the nice regal look. I'm actually considering swapping that to the uh, ivory crown. Once I actually grab that on this character. So that should complete the look rather nicely. Anyways, his stats, he's level 195. I just haven't had the chance to get him all the way up yet, but nice even stats across the board. Absolutely no investment into intelligence and as much dex and faith as I can really throw into him with a clear conscience. That's the character we're heading through on. The Cleric Small Shield is also a really nice parrying shield, so I'm considering whether I want to start diddling around with that with all these regular little frosty soldiers. Then again, this character is more suited for PvP than PvE, so we'll see how this whole thing turns out. I have a suspicion that my weapons are going to break a little bit more often than I'm really used to, especially because none of the hide weapons have a particularly good weapon durability in the first place. Ow. Oh, lovely. There we go. As you can see, this character really is just kitted out for maximum PvP effectiveness. We've got Sacred Oath and Lightning Spear, which is a whole 25... whatchamacallums? Yeah. 25 attunement just for those two spells. I'm surprised the Tanner didn't peek her head up. There we go. Because I do have the storm taken rid of at this point, so she really should have aggroed. Don't know what's up with that. Anyways, we're heading down to clear through the areas of the storm where there was ice in the way prior to this. So, a lot of lovely new locations have opened up as well as some loot which is finally available. These dogs still don't provide much of a challenge. Still not sure why they're there. But, oh well. This retainer over here. All ready to set up an ambush when I come for these items over here. Golden fruit bomb, dried root, and the retainer staff. So those things are definitely retainers I don't know why I was ever calling them priestesses. The priestesses were likely an order of singular priestesses that... Oh. 
Oh god, so many, so many people all at once. Let's let's kite this back a little bit. As I was saying, the priestesses were likely a single order with a very low amount of initiates and very long terms, usually their entire life, if my reading of the lore is correct. Speaking of the lore, I made a lot of inferences and discoveries and just mind-boggling conclusions in the lost footage that I'd like to take a second to go over. All these ice soldiers are they ice soldiers or are they crystal soldiers? Because there's nothing specific to them about ice. Except for, like, say, the <laughs> retainers. Getting on my nerves. And it really is my fault for not clearing the area beforehand, but that doesn't change the fact that they're getting on my nerves. But it really feels like they're, they're really not ice soldiers, they're crystal soldiers. Like, back in the Duke's archives, in Dark Souls 1. And when you start thinking about that, you start seeing some very disturbing similarities in the level and the location. All these vaulted cathedral-type buildings and highly decorative roofs. Where have we seen that before? Was, was there such an area in Dark Souls 1? And... Yes, yes, there very much was. This city is astonishingly similar to An Orlando, which was right next to the Duke's archives, where the Crystal Soldiers were kept under the guidance of Seath, who actually had discovered Golem technology pretty much all on his own. He had plenty of Crystal Golems. The thing that really started tipping me off was the growing crystal attack that some of the uh, larger crystal soldier golem things have where they actually grow a massive mace with their hand and just smack you across the face with it. And I was like, that move is extremely familiar. I've seen that someplace. I've fought against that before. And as I continued to think about it, I was like, you're right, I have. Back in Seath's archives in Dark Souls 1. What is an enemy from Dark Souls 1 doing in Dark Souls 2? That was a very good question, and then I started having a look about the place. I saw the forests below that were highly reminiscent of the forest on the lead-up to An Orlando. Then I took a look at the wall and realized, wow, and Orlando was built right into a massive wall on top of a cliff. And sure, we can't see down now, but there wouldn't even be much to see anyways because it was actually a fairly solid drop rather than a frozen waste built up over the years. So that's not really evidence one way or another. And then you start looking at the architecture, as I said. Oh, by the way, I was totally right. When I saw this little ledge, it was because one of these little retainers is set to sneak up behind you the moment you cross through the threshold of the building. But you've got a really good view from up here, so I'll have a nice panoramic look around. It seems very, very likely that this is an Orlando. Look at the architecture of that roof, the detailing on the little spire on the top. And take a second and go back and look out across the city from the roof of An Orlando. The similarities are disgusting. It's incredibly similar. I just don't know what to think of this. Especially because you already have the Crystal Soldiers, who are definitely uh, reminiscent of the Crystal Soldiers back from Dark Souls 1. And then you have the whole arena of, whatchamacallum, the Burnt Ivory King. Which is, like, item for item, almost a direct copy from Lost Isolith. Aside from the strange portals 
popping up everywhere. You you really would think you'd just gone back in time and put the wrong disc in. It's just staggering. I, I really don't know what to think of it because it is such a massive diversion from what I'd been expecting from Dark Souls 2, which up until this point I've been quite adamant is set in an entirely different land from Dark Souls 1. And I this is the first solid evidence to the contrary there. This is the first thing that's actually slapped me in the face to really challenge that belief with any measure of meaningfulness. And I'm just really taken aback. I don't think it's 100% confirmed one way or another. Like, I don't think that we are... 100% definitely in Ann Orlando right now, but at the same time, it's it's a very, very difficult... Oh, these guys. It's a very difficult assertion to combat. These guys are basically the bone wheels of this game, and they know it, and they are willing to abuse it. I found that if you have a sweeping weapon, they're pretty okay, or a weapon that can keep them at range. They're none too bad, but... Coming through here my first time, I was very taken aback by those guys. They are a very surprising enemy and just really catch you off guard. I never actually died to them, though, I am happy to say. I didn't have any deaths along this extra route that I'm heading down. Though, admittedly, I was a lot more cautious and was using a lot more life gems. Hexer Nikolai. And that bad boy up there. <laughs> it's always so weird when the lightning just jags like that. Is he going to drop down to meet us? He is. We can face him over here. Come on. Yeah, promise walk of peace. Doesn't matter to me. I can I can wait you out. If you get in melee combat with me, you're done. And none of your projectile spells can do anything. Oh, I don't want to follow him into that. But I have to. Nope. Not today, son. Or today. You know, whatever works for you. Oh, come on. Almost done. There we go. I'm, I'm worried, like, this guy hasn't aggroed yet. He seems like it should have. There we go. Just some more old growth bomb. And this spirit guy. Now that I get to deal with. Here we are. Cut him down just like the twiggy tree it is. I I don't know what those enemies are supposed to be, but it, I find it extremely strange that they're actually uh, corporeal enemies here, while the most we've ever seen of them is their spirit-like incarnations in the abyss. So, not sure what's going on with them. There we have it. That should be all of the little bunny enemies in the area taken down. Again, this is only my second time through, so I'm still not entirely certain about... Yeah. Still not entirely certain about this... Ooh, jeez. Let's back that up a bit. Okay. There we have it. Dodge right on past and come in for the sweeping blow. Those... Uh, little casters up there are slightly annoying, but that's their only really dangerous spell. Most of the time they're just plinking away at you in an annoying fashion and casting focus souls for some reason. Not that it's doing them too much good. Come on, you can't do that all day. Drop down, be a deer. Fine. I'll just take the bolt stone and go. See what you care. Now, is it this way? No, I believe... I believe this is the way to take on a certain phantom that I'm sure you all remember with much uh, derision. Yeah, don't, don't gesture at me. Don't pretend. You're going down, son. You can run away all you like. There's nothing in the previous chambers there. It's just a bait and switch. Oh, whatever. 
pull the lever while you're up here. Maldron's already buggered off to greener pastures. And you can take on this guy. Maldron here is ready to actually duke it out. And, oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> see you like them apples. Oh, yeah. Come on. Come on. Tell me he doesn't have infinite stamina. He has infinite stamina. This is BS. Especially because he's leading me into a trap right now. And there's nothing I can do about it if I don't want to let him go off and heal. Which it looks like I'm going to do. So, so much for that. That's actually especially frustrating because the first time around I managed to take him out before he ran off. So, that's entirely my fault. I knew he was going to do that, and yet, he got away anyways, so, bugger all. Let's play it smart and repair everything. My first time through here, I didn't actually realize there was a bonfire on this upper level here, until I'd pretty much left the area behind entirely. It was only in uh, doing some last minute exploration that I managed to find this little bonfire here, and boy was I surprised. I was like, really? Well, that's awfully nice of them. I only wish that I had found that sooner. I don't know exactly what that's going to do to Maldron, but uh, hopefully he'll be nice and have reset his position. And that guy casting Focus Soul again. I don't really understand why. Like, I think that they would do much better if they just focused on offense. As it stands, they don't really do much with the uh, Focus Souls, since they, they never really even hit with it. But let's try for Maldron round two, if he actually responds up here, which he does. Oh, and he's nice and doesn't run off immediately. That's his mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. I'm just going to hunt you down. Aren't you down like the dog you are? That should have been a lun a dropping attack. Plunging attack. What's a dropping attack? But uh, I do know what, exactly what is coming up next, so... I am just going to pursue Maldron willy-nilly. It's not like the mini-boss up here is going to pose me much of a threat. It's just a redo of the Covetous Demon. Oh, hello. Did I say not going to pose me much of a threat? I mean, is totally going to set me on my butt so that I have to immediately bugger off and heal myself. And is Maldron healing? I think that was a slight heal on his behalf. Can't be certain. Come on. Come on, mate. Yep. See how you like them apples. Right in your face. Ooh. Definitely don't want to get caught up in that tail attack. Luckily, he has really long attack animations and is slightly weak to piercing attacks. So, a lance is actually one of the ideal weapons to take down this guy. Oh, I really just need like a pair of hits on this guy. Or, I could get flattened like that. Ah, humbug. Well, it's not... not huh. I wonder if I completely ignore Maldron, whether or not he'll come down after me. Let's try that strategy out, because there, there's no actual need to uh, head up to Maldron's location once you've actually opened the doorway, so can I just completely bypass him? Let's find out. Run along here. Another bit of weirdness is the catalyst they use. It looks a little bit like the Witch Tree Catalyst, but at the same time, it also looks like the um, Willisil Catalyst from Dark Souls 1. There's just so much in this place, like these crystal caves here, that is a direct callback to Dark Souls 1. And I really don't know what to think about that. It's just such a strange design decision, since I've pretty much been working this entire game under the... Uh, idea that Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2 are set on basically different continents. 
my overall idea was that Dark Souls 1 is actually... Oh, okay, that was just a strange AoE hitbox. It wasn't actually Maldron coming down to mess me up. I'd been working under the idea that Dark Souls 1 is set in Lordran, which is actually the land of the giants here in Dark Souls 2. Because Dark Souls 1 in Lordran, they clearly had the ability to produce golems, and they actually had golem servitors. And while they don't the giants don't actually act as servitors here in Dark Souls 2, their nearest counterpart, the golems, very much do. They were used to construct the entirety of Dragon Lake Castle and perform menial tasks. It's only in this DLC that we actually get to see them fight at all. And boy, do they pose a threat. God, these bunnies. I swear. But, um, this theory was bolstered by the fact that, uh, but all of the words, the giant blacksmith and the two giants in Sen's fortress bear a striking resemblance to the giants of this game with masks covering their faces so we cannot actually see the uh, hole that is the hallmark of the giants as well as metallic skin that is not fitting at all for an actual living being. When I first played through Dark Souls 1 before I had any experience with the lore or any of the really big ideas that are present throughout the game, I actually thought it was incredibly strange that these giant humanoids had incredibly metallic skin, but as I played more of the game and became more familiar, I kind of just took it as granted that that was just a special quirk of the giants and that they were real living beings because that's what the lore kind of implied. I never actually took the time to re-examine that until much, much later. Just gonna kite around to draw certain aggros and deal with these guys in a slightly more singular way. So much for that. Ugh. Stop. It's, this level is just the absolute dickens because it throws a lot of enemies at you and some of them just stomp you down like they are not even playing oh hey I triggered my attack but as I was saying I kind of didn't examine that re-examine that notion that they were just regular giants until I actually played through the DLC Artorius of the bit of the abyss and we actually met Go. And he just kind of threw a wrench in the works because he actually has regular skin. He doesn't look like any of the other giants in the entire world. He is unique. And why is that? Because he's an actual giant rather than a construct. At least that's how my interpretation goes. This is also very evident in how the giants interact. Uh, the giant blacksmith has a single task that he's been repeating for basically it's his entire life. Even since the days when Hawkeye Go was still around, he all he was doing was blacksmithing. That's, that's all he ever did. He has never left his post. He's never stopped blacksmithing, even after everyone in the entire city, basically has left for greener pastures. Why is that? That's that's not the actions of a sentient thinking being. That's that's the actions of a machine, an automaton. Look at the giants over in Sen's fortress. It's the same thing. They have literally sat around for centuries, eons even, doing absolutely nothing. Waiting for trespassers. All, all they do is sit there and perform that one same task over and over and over again. Whether it's dropping a boulder down a chute, whether it's uh, lobbing firebombs, massive firebombs, though, down at passerby, or whether it's waiting your entire lifetime 
to hear a single ringing bell. And once you hear that single ringing bell, pull a chain. Okay, sorry, a pair of ringing bells. And once you hear those specific pair of ringing bells, you pull a chain, and then you wait there again for all eternity. That's not something that living beings do. It, this is also evident in the dialogues. What's his face? Uh, Hawkeye Go is very articulate. And while he's kind of dumb, he's a very wise individual. He has a lot of insights into life, and he really is one of the only people who treats you as, like, a being with their own wishes, their own thoughts, their own, uh, whatchamacallit, their own animus, I suppose. Everyone else in the game kind of just huddles you along their own path, their own wishes for you, and what you can accomplish due to your unique gifts, both of undeath and incredible strength and combat prowess. While Go, he actually has a very diverse set of dialogues, and even so far as to just wish that you live life as you best see fit, as opposed to being taken along this crazy, demented ride that everyone else seems to have set out for you. That's pretty much why I think that he's so different from the other giants. Which, if you look at the giant blacksmith, he can't even form proper sentences. This is, this is not an intelligent being. This is a being who was created for one very specific task, and he does it very well. He was able to recreate the lightning bolts of the ancient warriors by just the description that Go gave to him. Is, is that actually a one-shot? Cool. And so that's kind of the basis for what I was thinking. That Dark Souls 2 is set in Dreng Lake, which is across the sea from Lordran, which is the level of Dark Souls 1. In Dark Souls 1, you meet golems and pass them off as giants, whereas there's only one true giant, one living being, and the rest are just fancily constructed golems. And it is from Dark Souls 1 that, and Lordran that Vendrick actually stole the secret of creating... Okay, how do I do this again? The secret of creating these giants, these constructs, these golems. And that is how he learned to create the golems in this own world of his. And that is why... Once the secret of creating these golems, these giants, these constructs has been stolen, Lordran sends an army of war golems to punish Vendrick. They are infused with a soul, uh, and one single burning desire above all else, hatred for people and the desire to kill or punish Vendrick for his crimes against Lordran. I'd been wondering how this gap was meant to be traversed, and as you can see, it's got a very simple answer. Just lob a boulder across it. Uh, that really cracked me up my first time. Oh, <laughs> as you can see, I don't have room for those cracked red eye orbs. This character is kitted out for PvP in the Brotherhood of Blood, and yeah, I've, I've got 99 orbs at this point. I've gotten to rank 1 but I haven't taken it any further than that. Let's, let's aged feather out of here because I don't want to deal with any of this and there's an alternate path back down at the base, I believe. I don't quite recall from my singular first run what exactly is down there. And as I've been saying, I've, I've been working this entire time under the impression that Dark Souls 1 is Lordran, Dark Souls 2 is Drang Lake, they're mutually exclusive, they're on different continents even. And yet, this whole city of Alayam Lois has finally thrown a massive wrench into that. This is the first real evidence that 
No, that's that's not the case. Dark Souls 2 is quite possibly set on the same continent as Lordran, at which point we have no idea what the Land of the Giants is, where it is, why it is, or how it works. We just have no... Oh, did I not rest at the bonfire? I am silly. Let's... Well, I think if it's not too long of a path that we could still make this, but, uh... Yeesh, that is foreboding, to say the least. I don't have a lot of health here, and I'm running direly low on Estus Flasks. But, yeah, this is the first real challenge to that notion that I've come across, and I don't know how to make sense of it, really. Oh, this just leads around to the area beforehand as kind of a shortcut path once you've made it through that whole encounter. So, we can just leave. That, that sounds like a good idea, everybody. We're just going to go. Okay, I believe there's still some unfinished business somewhere along the line. Hmm. Yes, I remember freeing at least one more knight, and so let's see if I can't find out exact... Oh! Oh, first off, I need to activate the stone door with the four torches in front of it, so we can just sprint our way along there until we reach the proper location. It's still best to start from this initial bonfire, just because it's mm, closest and with the least amount of troublesome enemies along the way. So just head on down there, and in the meanwhile, I can keep going over just some of the ideas I've been milling about in my head ever since coming to this DLC. And what exactly they mean for the series? Oh, that's right. I forgot to access this secret once I had lifted up the coffins. I believe I had lifted up the coffins in my first episode, but had not come down to check what was behind them. Oh, hits through the wall? What is this? That's not fair. Yeah, that should have killed both of them, so pardon me for that. Let's take care of that now. No, no, no. This is actually a really cool chest. It's got the um, crystal something or other. Soul Flash, that's right. It's basically a short-ranged spell, Wrath of the Gods, which is it's pretty nice. Uh, spells in general didn't have very much AoE capacity, and that kind of adds a little bit of versatility to them. And the North Warder set up there is also really cool. It specifically mentions Ferosa as being its place of origin, which is another interesting theory that I've come across after uh, looking about online, is that this kingdom here is the kingdom of Ferosa. It has a lot of frozen elements to it, which kind of fit because of the equipment that we all know comes from Ferosa. The North Warder set is very large and warm. What's I call it? Oh, how do I... Okay, yes, that way, in the tower. The North Warder set is a large, warm cloak type setup. The Ferocian Lion Knights wore armor with heavy cloth padding and even a uh, fur little collar to protect them from the cold. And look at Vengarl's set. It is almost entirely cloth. It's made up to protect its wearer from the cold more than in battle, and yet it does a stellar job of both, I would presume. It is almost entirely cloth, and for such heavy armor, that's incredibly out of place. But if you consider that it's actually meant to be worn in a climate of distinct cold, such as here in L.A.M. Lois, it makes a lot of sense, really. And the sort of barren nature of the city is easily explained by the fact that once the kingdom fell, Anyone who wasn't 
hollow or a crystal golem, as you can learn that the uh, crystal soldiers out there are, pretty much left. I believe the rampart golems, which are the large shielded hollows with lances as opposed to spears or the other weapons, but their equipment actually explicitly states that they are golems created by the White King, the Ivory King, the uh, master of this land, which is a little bit strange yet again, because where did the golems come to Drang Lake from? Well, they came to Drang Lake from across the sea when Vendrick stole the secret of the giants. How exactly would the White King know about this secret and its use unless Fendrick had brought it to him like he did to the old Iron King. That's a good question, and so it basically is a surefire way of dating this kingdom here all the way back to Vendrick's prime. I don't know why this guy's here. I really don't. It's another strange touch, but again, the Flexile Sentry was a creature uh, born by Aldia's wicked ways and used heavily by the kingdom of Drang Lake, strengthening the ties between Drang Lake and this lost kingdom of Alea and Lois. So that, that is the other interpretation that I think also could fit, is that Alea and Lois is Ferosa. It has strong ties to Drang Lake, it has golems which were brought to Drang Lake via Vendrick and his ilk. And so it's very cut and dry that there's at least some connection here, but is it Ferosa, which we know was was about the same time as uh, the prime of Drang Lake, as well as being, what should we call it, very uh, warlike and even... Uh, fell to some catastrophe in the lore. That is what led all the citizenry to wander the world as bandits and sell swords. So, the, the, it's quite possible that Elaine Lois is, whatchamacallit, Ferosa, and that, oh, the garrison ward key. And let's pick that item up over there. But that it is Ferosa, and the reason there's no real human enemies left is because everyone fled, and all that really remains is the animals and golems. Be they the very simplistic golems that look like the ones that Vendrick used to build his castle, or they the complex crystal golems, such as the rampart golems and such. Who can say? Let's get out of there. Goodness, what is this? I I don't want any of this. This is this is bad. I should not have approached that last encounter that way. Let's go in spears a blazing with my lance. See how they like them apples. Lance is really great weapon to keep between you and the enemy. Hmm, experiencing some little bit of stuttering here on the edge of these areas. Don't know what that's about. There we go, back to smooth. Lovely stagger capacity on the lance, especially on the long multi-hit running combos. Ooh, ouch. Anyways, I don't really need to fight them, I can just tag the bonfire. There's nothing more for me to do with them. And so, those are the two predominant lore interpretations that I've seen for the area. And I'm, I'm still not certain which one I believe the most. If nothing else, it is clear that this area is meant to be a callback to Drang Lake. Not to Drang Lake, but to Lordran. But that it doesn't really confirm one way or another, for me at least, whether or not it is Lordran. And whether these are the same crystal soldiers as in the Duke's archives. And whether this is the same architecture as in Orlando. There's just a bunch of questions for, in my mind, and not a whole lot of answers. There's theories, but not a whole lot of evidence to support them one way or another. Yes, this place is built over the old chaos, but 
Is that the same old chaos that the Witch of Izalith created? Is it some different old chaos that transpired in between uh, the time of Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2? We just don't know. There's no way of really telling one way or another. Hell, it could be the old chaos that once her face the lost sinner created when she attempted to relight the first flame. We just don't know. And that's that's kind of the crux of the issue in my opinion is that we don't know. There are certain fitting explanations, but they're not exclusive. They're they work together kind of. Neither one can just be declared canon. But both of them have their merits and their certain supports. I really just don't know where to stand yet, especially because I it just would be break my entire notion of the lore if I were to consider Ferosa not Ferosa, but uh Elaine Lois to be an Orlando. Like, look at that architecture, that cathedral. What does that remind you of? Just right off the bat. It's incredibly clear. And while it's a throne room here in Alam Lois, it has just a startling, startling resemblance to an Orlando. It's it's weird. I don't know where to, I stand on this. Oh, come on. Stop that. I just want to backstab. And I'm pretty sure backstab is a one hit kill for these guys. Which is weird, because you would, you would really expect them to have more health than the than the regular hollows. I want to come in here to pick up not the regular hollows, but the regular golems. Pick up all these lovely, lovely chests here. Now that the storm has been done away with and all the ice has been released. Just so much loot. I'm so happy. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten the mimic that was caught in the ice. But at the same time, I really wouldn't have to remember it because there just seems to be a lighting problem going on with all the DLCs in at which like secrets like that are extremely obvious. The mimic looks entirely different from all the other chests due to some lighting error as well as the lighting error in the throne room, <laughs> which is just so silly really messed up and I, th I think they were trying to fix that with the extra time that they delayed this DLC with but I can't say one way or another I just don't know but here's where they give you just a bunch of wonderful drops even some bright bugs which really really great over there I picked up the garrison ward key which actually allows me entrance to that room over there then again, I start that at the beginning of the next episode, so I don't need to go over that. I didn't lose that footage, thank God. But, yeah, still very frustrating from my perspective. I believe I have... Have I? No, I, I think there's still some things to be done within this castle area. Possibly down this doorway, is it? No, it's one of the sections later on where you head inside the walls. But, alas and alack, I lost all that footage, so I have to do it all over again. This time, at least, I have a little bit more to talk about that's not quite as reactive, since I've had at least a little bit... Ooh! Ooh! A new lance! It is strength scaling and magic scaling, so this is actually complete crap for me. But it is cool to actually have just a strength scaling lance that incorporates some magic. Hmm. Cool sauce. Oh, and I believe I missed out on heading down over there, so let's, let's head there now and kind of discuss what was going on with that area. We can also pick up this box right here, which is now not frosted over. Which gives you some nice Elizabeth mushrooms. Good stuff. Hello there, dear. You are going to go right on down. But I learned uh, 
coming through here just exploring randomly that this area actually has quite a number of invisible soldiers just like the one wielding the drake keepers uh great axe down right after you pick up the eye that allows you to see the unseen there we go oh, how that how did that last one miss i call shenanigans yeah of course they have infinite poise but you know what screw them i have tons of stamina and that unlocks this lovely little pharos contraption here and be honest who doesn't like pharos contraptions you can open this on up and grab your loot Dirgo's hat for all of you out there who spent ages farming the bastard well sorry all that work pretty much in vain if you have the DLC at this point because you can pick one up on each and every one of your characters forever I personally think that's a good thing but it does suck that all your time is basically put to waste I think it's really good because I didn't like the farming system where everything was uh, just artificially scarce all the time. But at the same time, I do understand that it kind of punishes those who still went out of their way to farm them. I think that that's just an issue that they have with Dark Souls 2 is that they uh, mucked with the way people farm in that they gave you one-time phantoms that have a small, like, ridiculously small chance of dropping an item and expected that to suffice. And I just don't think that does the job at all. Like, I am a major fan of the cursed, uh, yeah, the cursed bone shield. And only once in my entire time playing this game have I ever had one drop from any of the, uh, Aldia warlocks dotted throughout the game and there's three of them you would think that in over like 30 plus playthroughs where I've completed the game that I would have found at least two because that's that's at least 90 times killing each and every one of them but no in my entire time playing I've only ever had one of them drop so yeah it, it, it's just very wonky how they set up that system it's very frustrating. Don't rate it at all. And at least they're taking steps to sort of fix it here in the DLC. They are going out of their way to give you some of the drops that they've held back from you all this time. I, I really like that system and like I said it does kind of punish people who went through all the effort of farming them but oh well. It's better to punish a few, not, and it's not even punishing, it's just kind of devaluing their effort, but it's better to do that to a few people as opposed to keep the game messed up for just everybody across the board. Oh, come now. Don't be, don't be shy. Let's have that sort you out. I believe you can make the drop there, but uh, it's probably a bad idea. I'm not going to lie. There we go. Three hit combo and he's down. What's out here? We have the Ring of Resistance plus one, which is basically the dispelling ring, but it augments all of your resistances instead, so it's, it's kind of a crap ring. There's very few places you'd want to pull that one out. Though, there, there are a few locations where I suppose it could be considered useful. Namely, Sholva and possibly Black Gulch, though I don't think the poison there is actually that big of a deal. I think the problem is just people being impatient. There we go. What's in this little gem of a chest? Just wilted dusk herbs. Not too valuable, but it does pull the attention and give you a nice little bit of loot, so I'm not going to complain. These... Uh, crates everywhere as opposed to when Orheim invaded they're not meant to trick you into uh, getting caught by an invader they're here to trick you into missing some of the doggies on your way through and getting caught by them 
And here we are at the second night, I believe, is across the way here. The second night that you actually get to free. However, Castaway Witch Donna has other plans for us. Not that I particularly care too much. I can stunlock her very nicely. Even when I can't, she holds her shield up and... Oh, hang on. I do not remember this. I don't remember this at all. I may have made a horrible mistake. Never mind. We're all good. Since I kill those guys in a one-shot on the backstab, we're pretty okay. Ah, I keep rolling through that when the ideal uh, choice there is to wait or even just parry it because it comes out so slowly. And that's the one of the main reasons that I have this cleric small shield is for the parry frames, which are actually spell parry frames. I set up this character almost immediately after... Uh, the buff to spell parrying because I figured out how incredibly useful it be had become and really wanted to build a character with a uh, par spell parrying small shield that I can also use for regular parrying and since I barely ever use it to block it might be better to go with the cleric's parma but at the same time I just love the fashion souls of this very very intricate golden shield, so I'm willing to uh, waste the extra one weight of uh, unit of weight in order to get the fashion souls for this character because he just looks like such a golden beast. I knew I wanted to make it a heavy faith-focused character, and I think I I think I pulled it off rather handily. Really proud of this, how this guy looks, and if I'm not mistaken, that's pretty much everything that I managed to discover on my lost footage. I have since learned that there are four white knights around the place, but I still have yet to discover the fourth. I've only ever gone into the uh, boss fight with three by my side in order to fully negate the uh, three spawners. So... I just don't know where the missing one is. I could look it up, but I haven't taken the time just yet. And since this is... Oh, excuse me. Since this is still supposed to be in place of a blind run, I would much rather just leave that how it is and uh, have the footage kind of match up, because it would be strange if I went around and gathered all four White Knights only to head into the boss fight with three in the next episode, so... That's going to be it for the episode. Thank you so much for watching. I really apologize for the inconvenience here. No one's as frustrated as I am when it comes to what happened with the footage here. So just know that I really looked around a lot for ways to recover the footage and nothing worked. I was forced into this, but, uh, you know, I think it still works out really well because it gave me a little platform here for me to talk about all of the, uh, all the strange little lore connections that are buzzing around in my head. So with my next series coming through this DLC, I'll be talking a lot more about the design and how the areas are laid out with Faros the Vagabond, just so that I can sort of cover my bases, because this is really a, a, a wonderfully designed area, a wonderfully designed DLC you know, except for the, the challenge area, which we, we will see in the next episode. So I'll let you get my impressions then. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. It has been a pleasure as always, and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.